Hello everybody, welcome to number 27. I'm Jack. Now, if you were to ask somebody what the most revolutionary luxury car was, many would say the Lexus LS400. Rolls-Royce was always known for making quality car, but maybe not cutting edge. And yet, if you look at this, the Silver Shadow, this car was revolutionary, not just for Rolls-Royce, but it was the most advanced car out when it was launched in 1965. In comparative terms, it was a much bigger step forward than the LS400 ever was. It sold in numbers greater than any other Rolls before, and I think also since, perhaps some of the very latest ones like the Cullingham have overtaken it now, but 37,000 were made, not just that. But celebrity owners include Paul McCartney, David Bowie, Michael Caine, Elton John, Dean Martin, Johnny Cash, Frank Sinatra, Andy Warhol, and I'm gonna stop there because it would probably take us several minutes to go through the whole list, but it just gives you an idea of how incredibly influential and impactful this car was. We're gonna take it for a drive, but before that, I need to tell you just what it was that made this so advanced. Also, with this particular car, we're really lucky to have service records dating back to 1980. So I'm gonna be able to tell you exactly how much it has cost to run in the 33 years since that time. Incredibly, this must be one of the only cars which was smaller in external dimensions than the car it replaced, which was the Silver Cloud. Not only was it smaller, so it was um, six inches shorter, three inches narrower, but also it had more interior room. That was achieved because it was the first Rolls to have unitary body construction. Previous to this, most Rolls had been driven by chauffeurs with the passengers just sitting in the back. Rolls knew that that was changing to owner drivers. So the next step was the rear suspension. The Silver Cloud still had a solid rear axle. This went to fully independent suspension. Not only did it go to that, but it went to hydraulic self-leveling suspension. So a massive step forward. The next step was the braking. Silver Cloud still had drums. Not only this, did this go to discs, but Rolls, in a feat of utter madness in my view, went for a dual braking system. Now I believe the twin caliper setup is only at the front, but there was another reason why Rolls did this, and that is that if one of your braking circuits failed, the other one was still there. So ultimate safety, but I think altogether a bit of a nuts, overcomplicated idea. Lastly, the doors, the boot and the bonnet were all made of aluminium. But it's not just those technical advances that make this so special. It is the incredible quality that in my view, hasn't really been repeated since. And I'm gonna show you some examples. Let's take a quick look at the body first. The tightness of the shut lines was pretty unheard of for the mid 60s. The quality of the sheet work, nice thick steel, top quality steel. The reason why so many of these are still around is that they were so well made. Look at the front, look at the bright work, look at that radiator, the lights around, everything does simply scream quality. If you go to the back of the car, look at even the little handle for the boot, the way that's designed so you can sort of pull it up, it, everything is beautiful. Then of course, there's those bank vault like doors. So push the little button in, pull the lovingly crafted handle, and then let me show you some of the mad interior stuff. So comfort was the absolute priority with these and you can see it because I can make it rock very, very easily. We'll see how that translates on the road. But the level of detail that the engineers went to is just astounding and the cost to engineer some of this stuff and to produce it. So for example, these little side armrests, they're adjustable for movement up and down. There are of course acres of leather, veneer, but there are some other touches that are really staggering. The glove box, for example. You open it with that lovely, delicate little catch. 
And then when it opens, it's fully like an inch thick. It is absolutely ridiculous. Then the controls for the seats, these lovely metal joysticks. And now these are the sorts of details that in later cars, to me, the switch gear is slightly cheapened. On this, there's only one cheap looking switch, which is the radio aerial. Everything else is just fantastic. The hazard warning light is a thing of beauty and it works with a really lovely movement. The pull and push switches and turn for the heating. And although this used the same gearbox as the Cadillacs, it was a GM automatic unit. On the Cadillacs, it had mechanical actuation on the lever. On the rolls, for ultimate ease of use and lightness, they had an electrical actuator. So it makes that lever incredibly pleasant to use. Now, I could go on and tell you about lots of the other things. So for example, the pull and push switches for the ventilation, but I think it's time we took it out and see how all of this actually translates on the road. Okay, switch it on. It actually does sound very good, but that engine is the one thing of this car that wasn't particularly advanced. I love that little drive, the gearbox selector, so light, it really suits it, along with this so thin steering wheel. Anyway, back to the engine. So the very first clouds had the 6.2 litre V8 rolls, uh, which unlike what most people think was not an American engine, it was completely a Rolls-Royce engine. This one, which is a 71, had the benefit of the bigger engine. So that's the 6.8 litre. They're all aluminium, which is good. But in terms of power, the 6.2 put out 175 horsepower and this one 189. So in terms of horsepower, it's really pretty feeble, but that's not what these cars were all about. Rolls-Royce always had the, said the power was sufficient. And I think they're right. It's really about the torque. And it's about feeling like you're driving something in a very effortless way. And certainly, all these years later, this definitely does feel like that. The ride is still absolutely supreme. It is just incredible. It's the combination of those Citroen hydraulics, but modified to work with springs, and then dealing with this sort of two ton sort of weight, which means that it just sort of smothers the road, it smothers the bumps. two variations of shadows this is a shadow one the first one there was also the shadow two which i believe came out in 74. the shadow two externally i think looked a bit uglier it had some plastic in the bumper some other detailed changes and the interior wasn't quite as nice as this as i mentioned the two i think already changed some of the switch gear and had some of the nastier looking stuff on there but it did drive better than this. It had a different steering rack. I don't know if they went to rack and pinion, but this is worm and roller. And it is really quite laughable just how imprecise this is. Um, the steering is so slow, but also it's kind of, you just sort of aim it and hope that you're gonna be roughly where you want the car to be. Probably not a big issue because most of them would have been driven ever so slowly. And it's going to be utterly pointless, I think, to try and see how quick it is. But all the same, I'm just going to come out of this junction now. So use that lovely, delicate indicator switch and just floor it and see what it does. just touched down on the road there because there's so much movement in the body but do you know what it it's uh, it's quicker than than you would think i mean it's obviously just pure torque but 
it gets a move on. You still wouldn't describe it as a quick car, but you'd have absolutely no problem keeping up with any traffic nowadays in terms of pure pulling power. You literally float down the road, you really do. And, oh, touching down again, I wasn't going that quick. Uh, I wonder if there's something loose underneath somewhere. But sailing down the road is really quite apt with this thing. Although the steering is really imprecise, it's so light, it kind of matches all the other controls. And it's the thinness of the rim as well. It's almost to say, look, you don't need to worry about it with this car. You know, you can drive it on a fingertip and literally you can drive it on a fingertip. It's, it's incredible. Now, dynamically, it's not even worth comparing to other cars because, of course, it's unbelievably soft. As I've said, the steering is incredibly vague. Here we are now in the little famous S. And you go in and it just, even at really modest speeds, you can feel it's doing its best to understeer. It doesn't want to turn. And, and then it, it kind of leans a lot as well. It is absolutely like a ship at sea. It pitches, it rolls, <laughs> but it all makes it all the more charming. Initial turning is slothful. And then once it's kind of loaded up, I guess, and it's done its leaning, it starts to move round the corner. So this is a 1971, but it's been owned by the same family since 1980. And I mentioned at the beginning, I was going to tell you how much it's cost to run. Just a word about the general condition first and I think it has an absolutely lovely patina. So the seats are fine, they're not, you know, they're not worn or anything, they're not cracked, but they have that patina, the colours just rubbing through in, in quite a few places. And Scott, the owner, thank you, Scott, for bringing it down, was saying, oh, you know, maybe should I get them recoloured? And I was saying, in my opinion, absolutely not. I love the amount of patina that this car has. The seats are absolutely fine, they just could do with a bit of feeding, but I really wouldn't colour them. Also, uh, apart from that, there's the, the dash here, the front of the dash, the veneer, the lacquer has clouded over, so that would probably need doing. The quality of the veneer is such that it's a shame that you can't see it properly. But that's the only thing. Everywhere else, as I say, there's little signs of patina of use, but a very nice car. His father-in-law, who he's now inherited it from, actually used it for weddings. But when he bought it, it already had 65,000 miles. So in those first nine years of its life, it did a lot of mileage. And apparently the first owner had a house in Portugal. So that's how it did all those miles. Since 1980, it has cost a grand total, are you ready, of 57,000 to keep on the road. And that includes a full repaint, which I think isn't too bad. So it's 2.5 two and a half, two pounds 50 per mile. And oh, then there was a little dip there again. I was afraid it just sort of kissed. So I think something must be loose, but 2.5, yeah, two and a half pounds per mile. But more interestingly, if you look at it in terms of its 33 years, it's 1,700 pounds a year, which really isn't bad. It drives really very, very well. Um, so overall, if you compare it to Ferrari of the time, I'm sure that would have cost significantly more. They're absolutely not rewarding as drivers' cars. They're not, they're not fun to drive, but they require absolutely zero effort. And that's what it's all about comfort, effort, it's very, very quiet. So, to sum it up, an incredibly groundbreaking car for the time. And some of you will probably have bristled when I said that it was a much bigger step forward than the LS400, but I stand by that. Why do I say it? Well, the LS400 was incredible in that it did everything better than the current crop of cars in the 90s, the luxury cars in the 90s, for less money. But it wasn't a revolutionary. It still kind of used the existing principles and just refined them. This, compared to the previous Silver Cloud and to many cars of its time, 
Some of the engineering is absolutely gobsmacking. You know, that suspension system and not only is it groundbreaking, but these touches that you see, the switch gear, the glove box, the catch on the glove box, all this stuff has just never been repeated. Luxury cars now are still built to a price. So Scott's obviously inherited this car and he's trying to decide what to do with it. He might be amenable to selling it, so I'm gonna put his email address in the video description. If you're interested, do get in touch with him. I think total mileage now is 88,000, but it looks like a nice car and it drives pretty well. I'm also keen to do a Camargue, any of the earlier ones, which I haven't done yet, so please get in touch with me if you have one and you wanna do a video. Also, have a look at this, a later, but really era-defining uh, car as well. Thank you all so much. See you soon.